My name's Kenny, also known as X Dragon X. My name's Ben, also known as the Holy Flame. And today we're going to be talking about basic 3D printing and what the possibilities are, and also what our roadmap into 3D printing was like. So the way we started, uh, the failures we met along the way, spectacular failures as well, <laughs> um, but also um, very big successes. Well, we're, in short, we're going to introduce who we are in a couple seconds, beside our names, of course. Um, we're going to tell you what 3D printing is, before the people that don't know. Uh, we're going to tell you about the most used methods of 3D printing. We're not going to cover everything, because there's a very wide variety of 3D printing and 3D printing methods available. Um, there's also a, different, a couple different types of 3D printers that are available. Again, we're not going to cover everything. We're going to cover the most used and commonly available ones. Then we're going to tell you about our successful projects that we've had. And our less successful. <laughs> which are, of course, fun, but less documented because well, yeah. we're going to sweep them under the rug and everything like that. And, we uh, rid of them. and we want to talk about our future in 3D printing and how we hope to involve everyone into that. So... Um, my name is Ben, also known as the Holy Flame. You can find me on, uh, on Thingiverse under the Holy Flame. And, uh, well, woke up. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a software engineer for a, uh, for a web shop here in, the, in Holland. And uh, my four hobbies, I, I play a lot of music. Uh, I play bass, and you'll hear about that. <laughs> in this presentation. Um, so yeah, I, I, I mainly make, as for things I, I like, is uh, ma mainly musical based. All right. Well, I'm Kenny, X Dragon X. I'm also on Thingiverse. Um, I try and share a lot of my different models with everyone because I don't believe in actually making money on 3D printing. I just want to invent new techniques, um, make it helpful in everyday uh, everyday situations, and I do that with my a couple of my hobbies. Um, I also am a bass guitarist, uh, but I also play the drums. Um, I ride a motorcycle. I've got a couple parts for that. I am also an airsofter, uh, and a lot of parts there are very expensive, so I try and recreate them myself with the same. Uh, either the same level of usefulness or even more useful uh, for the things that are not commonly available. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically who we are in short. 3D printing in general. Um, well, there's a lot of different 3D printing methods. Um, how is it done? And depending on how you look at it, even this is 3D a 3D printing. print. <laughs> Sorry, cheap word joke, had to be done. But there's a lot of different ways to 3D print. The usual way uh, people talk about 3D printing nowadays is the heating of a plastic, uh, or at least a plastic type material, until it's moldable enough to be ejected through a small nozzle into a 3D form. At that point, you start uh, using your motors to actually build up layers until it's a 3D figure which can be done in a variety of ways, using it sideways uh, with extra support. Um, some even have them in powders. And then you sinter the powder, you put another layer of powder on, on top of it, and you just keep going until at the end you pull your model out of the powder, and then you have your 3D print. There's a couple of 3D printing uh, methods. These are the most used ones. Um, we have stereolithography, also which known as a, a basic like resin basin, which uh, with UV light gets hardened and then gets pulled out of the uh, the basin one step at a time until yep. like a model gets pulled out of the out of the resin. Yep. And we were kind enough for the people that don't know what exactly what we are talking about and like visual aids to include a little GIF of it or GIF if some people prefer it that way. As you can see, it basically hardens a single layer by using a little LCD screen on the bottom and shining light through that 
by, and then curing the resin in the exposed spots. And then it pulls it out, dunks it back under, and repeats it for every layer and layer on top of that. It's quite a fast process, very detailed, but the resins can be toxic, uh, not just to breathe, but also to the skin. You need to wear gloves. It, it's more of an industrial type of uh, engineering. There are some hobbyists out there that are using it in home, but it's, it's, not, it's not that safe. Well ventilation required, also a lot of money because the yep. resin is pretty expensive. And of course there are gonna be, gonna be people that disagree with us. Sure, every, everyone has their own experience. It's just in our opinion, the SLA is not very practical. There's also the selective laser sintering, also known as SLS. Again, nice visual aids. Um, this is what, we, what I was talking about before with the powder. There's a laser on top of it that basically um, sinters the uh, sinters and melts the powder in there, and it slides a wiper over it with new powder. So every layer is a new layer of fresh powder, and then it sinters it to the layer before, which is very good. Gets you also a very high detail, but it's very expensive. So it's very rigid. It's a very tough material. And because it's so expensive, if you want something printed with SLS, it, it's recommended to have a bottom in your model and make your model hollow. Because for every piece of powder you use, even if it's trapped inside your model, you'll pay a lot of money. So having a hole on the other side of your model releases all the unused powder and makes the print cheaper. And lastly, we're going to be talking about the FDM printing, the fuse deposition modeling. That's the printing technique that most people use nowadays and are most familiar with. Are your, well, home and hobbyist type of 3D printers, which is basically heating up filament on, that's usually on a spool and then precisely positioning it on a 3D print and stacking that up in layers again. With those 3D printers, there's a couple types of printers. We have the Cartesians, Core XYs, Deltas, and then you have a whole lot of other range of printers. Yeah, you're, for example, the Double Delta, um, the Helix. Uh, there's, there's too many to mention, and there's new types coming out once every couple days, because there's so many different types. And there's so many people in the community just trying to expand it. Yeah. Um, the most familiar one is the Cartesian type of printer, which uses one or more motors per axis to move one side of the printer. Let me walk over there. <laughs> For example, this bed moves and it has one motor driving the bed to the front and the back. It uses two motors to lift the entire print head and has one motor to slide one axis along the way. That's one of the most used ones. Uh, for example, the Prusa uh, is uh, the most known one. Uh, that's why we have a picture of the Prusa i3. Yep. Um, there's a lot more. You've also got Chinese clones, um, non-Chinese clones, homebrew prints, laser cut prints. They're, this is the most common used printer out there right now. Lesser known, but still readily known, is a Core XY. And one of the most uh, used models for that is the Ultimaker. Uh, how that basically works is it has a dropping bed that is actuated by one motor at the bottom, which lowers the bed with the print. And uh, then we'll demonstrate for the people sitting over there. <laughs> there. <laughs> and there are two motors on the inside rolling some bars, which in turn, by a dual play of those motors, move the head from left to right and front to back. The head itself will not lower or raise. So that's right there. Yep. There's the motor there, and that slides this this carriage over the uh, of the belts. Yep. And our most preferred printer right now is a delta type of printer, basically consisting of a triangle which has bars rising up, which has a carriage lowering and rising along that route to actually move the nozzle towards where it wants to deposit the plastic. There's a lot of different types out there. 
you have got spools and motors on top, you've got them on the side, you've got them on the bottom. Well, some of them are basically just parts of scrap lying around and a big triangle frame. Could work. Everybody has their own thing. <laughs> We've got a couple successful projects. Um, we also got some prints when we brought... Oh, got a little feedback there. That's not nice. <laughs> We're going to pass those around. I'm working to that. <laughs> Hold your horses. <laughs> you go in this hand press. Got enough different types of print you can throw around. All right, we've got a couple types of print that everyone is holding right now. We've got some 3D scans um, in, sp in sp peculiar my face. Uh, we've got a 3D printed lion, uh, which has its hairs printed outright, and then you use a blow dryer uh, to actually just comb its hairs. Um, the one she's holding right now is a hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil skull of Tower of Skulls. And if you inspect it closely, there's also one side which has been cleaned up, and the other side which uses, which still has the filament in there, the supports. With, because the plastic is being heated uh, at usually 200 plus degrees Celsius, just to be safe, um, it becomes very viscous, very liquid. And to make sure it doesn't start sagging, as soon as you print an overlapping layer which falls to the outside, um, it needs supporting material to make sure it doesn't sag. So that way you can inspect how that works in uh, parts that actually lean out a lot. We also have a so-called torture egg, which are basically three very narrow printed parts in each other, which is sometimes quite hard because not every printer has the tolerances to actually separate those parts or fuse the parts together during the printing. For example, this is a print-in-place piece. It basically moves um, and is being printed in one go. See, I believe it's printed somewhere halfway closed, somewhere around here, I believe. Yeah, it's and then like by uh, opening up some um, some parts that might have been fused during the printing, and by slightly rotating everything, it basically is an enclosed print with everything together. But at the same time, you actually have a moving part. No extra screws or whatever required. We also have some uh, filament swatches, which is going around. Um, There's also a tiny white part, and um, that's, well, it, it is a filled print. But what you can see on it is how the infill works. So how yep. the inside of the model isn't just empty. It has some support structure on the inside, which holds up the top layers. Yeah, and not every print is solid. A lot of people think that a 3D print is completely solid, and that's, that, that's where they get their strength from. Most of the time, a 3D model is nothing more than a, basically a shell which is being modeled, which a with a lot of uh, faces, a lot of polygons uh, meshed together. But there is nothing on the inside. As soon as you turn the model inside out, usually when you try and print it, it doesn't do anything, because it doesn't see any 3D model anymore. Because it only sees negative faces, and a negative face doesn't have to be used. There are exceptions, but that's that's the biggest rule of thumb usually in 3D modeling. Um, there are also some uh, little tokens and keychain hangers going around. Uh, those are uh, printed with two colors at once, uh, using a single nozzle. I'll tell more about that later. It's, they were printed on this machine uh, with one of our own developed parts. Um, further than that, I've also printed a complete computer case for an I, for an ATX computer as one of my big successful projects. <laughs> um, <laughs> rough estimate around three kilos. Including the fill prints? Uh, include no, not including the fill prints. <laughs> well, we're, we we sweep the fill things under the rug. We don't talk yeah, about yeah, them. Yeah. 
We're going to expose them later on a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, these are one of Ben's prints. Yeah, uh, so this is... Um, this was actually at, a, at a, a pizza party, which was at Rap Rap World, where this is Kenny's print, no. these are mine, and this is Dimitri's. We were the top three yep. of that month. So these are um, some Egyptian-styled uh, uh, chess pieces. These are the knights. Yep. My print is a airsoft chronograph, which is basically used to measure the speed of the uh, airsoft BBs being shot and knowing how fast your uh, weapon is firing to make sure it's safe on the field and not injure other players, just tagging them. And so seeing as Dimitri's not here yet, we'll talk about his print. Um, <laughs> he printed a little vase. It wasn't that big or special on the model itself, but what he did after, he took the code that he usually uh, goes straight into a printer and he run it through a little extra program, and he overlaid an image by uh, ver by verifying verifying Var varying. by varying. Thank you. By varying the velocity of the nozzle at some points, it actually um, stretches out little parts of the print, and actually embosses the print in the object. And this is this can be done with any print. As soon as you have a default code, you can run it through that program. The program is called Velocity Painter. So if you people want to try it out, if you have a 3D printer, it's called Velocity Painter. And you had a flower, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a flower that was embedded. <laughs> <laughs> we have another Queen fan in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> <laughs> hey! <laughs> um, it, the designing this logo took me about three months, tracing it, making sure everything was printable. Um, it took a lot of time, but I'm very proud of it. Uh, the moment I posted it on Thingiverse, someone, uh, not, a, not even a day later, asked me, can you do the Innuendo album as well? <laughs> I haven't responded to that yet, because I don't know if I'm going to want to take another three months chunk out of my life with that. I am really happy with this, though. Um, the model itself has been printed with on a black big disc, and on top of that, I switched the filament and went into a gold. So it gives a nice big contrast, and I can uh, use it as a... Uh, record player dust cover. This is a, uh, a bongo I made. It is like this size. And uh, even the, the skin. skin was actually printed. So there's uh, a two layer skin on top of white filament. And from there it went into brown. And it actually worked. Unfortunately, the, the skin has been torn because um, people thought they were allowed to play with, on it with drumsticks and not just their hands, so yeah. they ripped through the skin. Yeah, unfortunately. It, it happens. We've also got so, uh, we are also proficient in lithophanes. It's basically taking uh, some pictures, uh, converting them into uh, thickened, thickened areas on a, well, a 3D printed slab. And by putting some light behind it, it actually gives a sort of sepia tone uh, image that comes right through, and depending on how thick it is, it l l uh, lets through less light. And the thinner it is, the more light comes through. Well, as, as some of you may recognize, this is actually at the Hacker Hotel. Um, my room's a bit messy to actually photograph the Falcon and not showing every little piece of mess around. So, for the people at home, this is also the entire rocket. Um, it's not mine, it's b printed by a guy named Ants in Africa on Thingiverse. D designed by a guy. Designed by a, a guy on Thingiverse named Ants in Africa. Um, the original model is about a meter high, and well, that, that's fun, but it's not as fun as a two meter high one. <laughs> I had a lot of filament left, I just went with a complete two meter high one. It is two times as, as fun, in fact. Yeah, and it's not completely uh, glued together or anything. The grid fins actually do actuate, just to sh have a little bit of realism, and there is even a second stage in there, complete with vacuum engine. How many different pieces are in the body? In, the, in just the body? In just the body, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, m nine major parts, and then separate parts for the landing legs, for the grid fins, uh, stuff like that. The engines. Quick come a quick total comes to around forty, just for fun. Let's say forty-two. 
This was a print I made for a friend of mine. He, uh, for his birthday, he's a Pokemon fan, so a Lucario, and his girlfriend at the time actually painted it. It was originally it was red, which you can't see anymore. It's just completely coated in 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 paint. It looks perfect, and 3D prints can actually take paint very well. It sticks on it and stays stick stuck. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of people that actually do that, uh, not, e not just printing something and then using it, but they also usually print out little tiny figurines for Dungeons and Dragons, for Warhammer, uh, Star Wars. Uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of options for that. Um, a lot of people also actually paint those as well. Uh, one of the people that actually does paint sometimes on the 3D printed parts, I know of one person, it's Michel. If you have some questions, you can ask him later after, the, uh, after our talk. And, well, from here we wanted to introduce Dimitri. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Eindbass. Um, at some point I... Uh, all right. <laughs> um, at some point I wanted to get some air, uh, upgrades for my airsoft rifle, but I wanted to get a new rail. This is basically the front part of the gun. That's this part. It's Excuse me for a little bit blurry picture, but it's this part and a little print of press a, a little printed suppressor, and it worked out really great, and uh, it saved me around a hundred euros just by printing it myself and not ordering one from a airsoft retailer. And there's a lot of ways you can save by doing designs like that. Have you printed a gun before? <laughs> <laughs> Only parts for it. Actual guns, I'm not going to print. It's, it's just, it's not feasible. They wouldn't be u actually completely usable. It's yes, just. It was in the news. <laughs> in America, it is. Uh, mm -hmm. A gun that could actually fire a bullet. A bullet and then explodes. And yeah. Of course. <laughs> it's workable without necessarily yeah. being feasible or practical. That's the so it's a suicide gun and you take one in the process. <laughs> Well, moving on to uh, things we sweep under the rug. <laughs> I, printed, I 3D printed a bass guitar body. I wanted to have a guitar that was my own, designed my own, and I would love to have uh, some LEDs and everything on the inside. As you can see, it actually looks fairly cool. The only problem was, as soon as I've started tensioning it and tuning it, I could tune one string and then it pulled over like a bowstring. <laughs> so it was completely unplayable. I've tried it. It didn't sound good. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounded, it like sounded a good on, bass. on one string and about one or two frets. And yeah. that was about it. Otherwise, you'd have to go like half a meter down and pressing it. So, so it's, it's doo -doo and then nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are maybe some cheap songs that are good with that, but. That yep. would also be an option. Yeah, yeah. We also thought about reinforcing the body with uh, steel bars, just steel bars going through some holes in the in the main body. Yep. And there's also another way. Uh, I was thinking about changing this in the next version because the next version is already on the way. Uh, this one has been printed laying down, so the entire guitar parts were flat, and that layers all the plastic in one specific layer, in one specific direction. But the parts aren't strongest in their layer direction, but actually across the layers. So what I'm probably going to do next time is print the guitar on its side in its part, and then indeed putting another steel rod through it, and that should help me basically have a playable 3D printed base. This is, another, uh, this is another way of non-successful prints. Enter Dimitri. <laughs> hey, Dimitri. Hello. Hi. So. This is another, like, failed print. Uh, we call this spaghetti. I mean, it speaks uh, for itself. It's, uh, it's one of these plates, which during print didn't stick to the bed as, as good as it, as it was intended, so it fell over. But since it 
just keep sprinting. It's just, yeah, you get spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, sprinting arms weak, filament spaghetti. <laughs> um, there are of course a lot of a lot of other uh, failures we've had. Um, I've had at some point had the entire hot end break off, embed itself into a part, and keep printing for about six hours. So I've had to reprint half my printer just to make it workable again. And there's a lot of ways you can prevent that. There's a lot of ways. Well, you can't, and just it just happens because of there uh, is a knot in the spool or things just don't work out right. Before we move on to our future, um, Dimitri, if you'd come here. Um, uh, there were a couple slides back where you were holding a gun. I was holding a gun? Yeah, yeah. Oh. at RepRap World oh, with yeah. my printed reel. Um, we just wanted to say thank you for, for this. For Hacker Hotel. For Hacker thank Hotel and this yeah. awesome weekend. Um, we actually have something for you. It is a 3D printed shirt. Wow. It says Eindbaas Modderman. <laughs> That's cool. And on the back, we have wow. the Hacker Hotel logo. Wow. Everything is 3D printed. Here you go. Your your shirt size, right? So we open face. Your girlfriend was in on this. She brought the shirt. <laughs> yep. Can trust nobody. <laughs> Thank you, man. You're welcome. Oh, that's awesome. So, doing a little 3D printed There's shirt. There's another one here, <laughs> and this is a different type of 3D printed shirt. These are all free 3D printed parts, yep. which are printed. A few layers, like one or two, yep. then a layer of uh, porous fabric, like Thule or Organza, and then resume the print. Because the, uh, the fabric is so porous, the plastic that gets put on top of the, uh, the Thule actually just melts to the bottom uh, layers that were already there. And from that point, you just print a bunch of parts and sew them to a t-shirt, and you got something that looks really nice. Yeah. And because there's space in between the actual prints and it's on that fabric, it's actually articulated. So everything can move, everything basically flows with the body. This was a proof of concept uh, that we wanted to try um, in, a couple t in a couple months, maybe, maybe a bit later, maybe a bit shorter. We're going to try and print a <coughs> uh, complete arm uh, of body armor first. And then yeah. if that works, we're going to actually go for a full body suit. But we're talking about future, future plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we basically also, in our road uh, coming here, we've s uh, I've started on a cheap Chinese printer. I spent 200 euros getting it from eBay. Uh, had to pay import tax at the last moment, uh, having it delivered, putting it together in a couple nights, starting learning how a 3D printer works, uh, how to set certain things, uh, running into a lot of errors because sometimes you just don't have the accuracy needed to actually get some good parts. Um, As then for me, it's a little different yep. because you started on a Cartesian device. I started on a Delta on my, in my internship under the supervision of Bart. So Hi, Bart. I learned a lot from Bart and from Russell. And uh, I started on, on Delta machines, such as the, the Delta right there. And uh, I built my, my 3D printer from, from scratch and from ideas that we saw around the shop. Uh, we started designing new parts for it and kept expanding on it. And from there, the, my, my first printer was born as the prototype that became this beast. <laughs> we've, we've designed it with three people, with Ben. Myself and uh, Steve Witte, who is at home right now. Uh, well, if he's watching, hi, Steve. <laughs> um, um, we're basically trying to bring good printers at an open source uh, platform so everybody can contribute into what we're doing. If someone has a better idea how to do something and uh, it's viable to put it in the design, let us know. We're going to work on it. And we basically want to have a low-level intermediary printer 
uh, for intermediary uh, knowledge of 3D printing, but with a lot of features and easy to use, uh, easy to use um, handling. Um, as a little fun note, we've basically named all of our printers uh, gem names. Um, so the very yeah. first one was Ruby. The first inspired was Ruby, which was Stave's first printer that he built with plywood. And uh, it was also a Delta, but it was uh, held together with plywood and steel bars. It was called Ruby. I think was provided by Dimitri. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that is right. It was right. laser cut by Dimitri. So then Ben built then, his first yeah, printer. My printer was called Sapphire. At that point, and I built my first printer, which was all, at least my first Delta printer. Uh, we've dubbed that one Azurite because it was blue and uh, blue and white. Um, and later words, Ben assembled his printer, which is called Emerald, which is green and black. And then we have this printer, which is called Almondine, and it's mostly found in black and red. So the color of the printer is actually correlates with the uh, yeah. with the gem that it's named after. That's for fun. I mean, it's still just a printer. If somebody doesn't want to name it, they can do that. Of course. Yeah, of course. We've we've also know we've also know one printer which is called uh, Bitch and Betty. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and well, as the name suggests, print don't always turn out like they should be. Um, we're we've basically we, we're wanting to start a start a little company, uh, not actual. Uh, not an actual company, just a, a, a well. It was not meant for profit, yeah. but I mean, we made these printers, we designed these, and we're we're willing to sell them. So if if people want them, we can provide you. And the designs are going to be open source in a while. So for the people that want to print them and already have their own printer, you could download the files and make your own printer. One thing you can actually buy are these extruders on the back. These, um, these extruders are actually also designed by us. It's called a Gemstruder. And uh, yeah, we like them. I mean, they're on the, on the gem stock. Yeah. And they are also all ready for purchase at RepRap World. We're not sponsored by anything. <laughs> what? <laughs> but the most important thing for us during the 3D printing, um, yeah, well, our, our road trip on 3D printing is to have fun during the printing. There's a lot of failure, there's a lot of new, th new and challenging things during printing, but at some point, everybody it hit, is going to hit a snag or something that they didn't foresee, a printer that basically self-destroyed itself because the head came loose, uh, a fan failing, parts tipping over. You're going for an end goal. Have what fun. What is a hobby without fun, Yeah. right? Yeah, that's basically what we're going for. Yep. And in the future, you can find us at gemstock3d.com. So if you log on now, you'll see that. <laughs> so yeah, we're working on it, and it's uh, it's becoming a thing. Yep. So this is basically our talk. Thank you for your time. Thank you uh, for if you have any questions. Listening. Come up to us. We'll uh, we'll answer them as uh, best as we can. And Michel also has brought his printed bastion. Uh, he's made a uh, replica from the game Overwatch. He actually made it drivable with an RC controller. So he's hmm? this box. Yeah. Are there any people that have questions for these two gentlemen here? Yes. I will do it with this mic because we. Uh we are recharging the batteries of the throw box. <laughs> um, I see on uh, almost all 3G printers, I see the, the cooling fans on the hot end. Uh, yeah. But what's the, the purpose of that part? To actually uh, directly cool the plastic the moment it leaves the nozzle. So that way uh, there is less support needed during the print. And you have better detail because as soon as you well, if if you start um, putting down a, a gel line with, I don't know, with any type of big, thick gel, as soon as it comes out of that nozzle or whatever you squeeze it out of, it starts running out until at some point it's reached its end viscosity. And that's the same with 3D printing. The moment it leaves, it's still hot, it wants to run out. And then as soon as you cool it, it sets in place. 
So as soon as it leaves the nozzle, for example, it's about this big, and then it wants to run out. But if you cool it directly, it either doesn't or doesn't have as much run out, and then your detail is also a lot higher. So you want to cool it as fast as possible. Yep. And some people have, instead of fans, they have complete air compressor setups and everything like that, but then they might as well print in a complete freezer or stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The deltas are, uh, are known for their sp uh, print speeds, uh, fast movement. Yep. Um, what print speeds are you getting out of this printer? Uh, we're getting nominal print speed out of a, from uh, of about 100 millimeters a second. And at that point, we're slightly starting to lose resolution, but we're looking into ways of upgrading that. Right now, this is a 12 volt printer. Um, there is a 24 volt upgrade coming, and we're going to make sure that. Basically, the stepper motors have extra power and everything to counter weird movements and basically keep printing. To put, a, put that a little bit into perspective, a label printer, a simple small little label printer, it prints at roughly 150 millimeters a second. So a 2D printer is just a little bit faster than this 3D printer. So we're working on it to make it even faster. Awesome. Other questions? We'll be able to do that in a couple seconds. Yep. We'll find a power outlet and start the printer up. Great. Any other questions? And if there are any questions that you're not, you don't want to ask now in, in front of a mic, you can always ask, come up to us after the talk. Yep. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> Interesting talk. Thank you. <laughs>